Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Friday the 13th. <laughs> Let's take a moment to acknowledge the traditional lands of those who came before and celebrate those who are here today in what is known in the present day as the Greater Pittsburgh Region, the Erie, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy made up of the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Seneca, Tuscarora, and Cayuga, Kaskaskia, Lenape, Massawomek, Mississauga, Osage, Shawanwaki, Shawnee, Susquehannock, Wyandot, Yuchi, and the pre-European contact cultures of the Adena, Hopewell, and Menangihela. Thanks everybody for joining. As you can see, Alan has another weekend off because we're about to open Endgame and he needs a break. Also, the lovely folks that I am talking with is kind of a follow-up to last week's webinar. Um, please welcome three members of the R18 Collective. I'm gonna give you short bios of each of them in alphabetical order. Joining us today, Misty Anderson is the James R. Cox Professor of English and holds courtesy appointments in both the Theater and Religious Studies Department at the University of Tennessee. Excuse me. Anderson is the author of Imagining Methodism in 18th Century Britain, Enthusiasm, Belief in the Borders of Self, and Female Playwrights and 18th Century Comedy, Negotiating Marriage on the London Stage, as well as numerous articles on the 18th Century Theater, Women Writers, and Comedy. She is a co-editor of the Routledge Anthology of Restoration and 18th Century Drama, Volumes 1 and 2, along with Danny O'Quinn and Christina Straub, and she is at work on a third monograph, God on Stage. She is one of the founders of the R18 Collective, which supports professional productions of plays from 1660 to 1800 that provide the genealogies of race, gender, sex, capital, and environment, excuse me, environmental impact shaping our present. Christina Straub is Professor Emerita of Literary and Cultural Studies at our own Carnegie Mellon University, where she taught 18th century British studies, theater and performance studies, gender studies, and sexuality studies. She is the author of Divided Fictions, Fanny Burney and Feminine Strategy, Sexual Suspects, 18th Century Players and Sexual Ideology, and Domestic Affairs, Intimacy, Eroticism, and Violence Between Servants and Masters in 18th Century Britain, as well as numerous articles on 18th century theater, sexuality, and gender. She has just published an essay on 18th century adaptations of The Tempest for borrowers and lenders, and an essay on censorship and the 18th century London entertainment industry to be included in the censorship of the British theater for Cambridge University Press, excuse me. She co-curated Will and Jane, Shakespeare, Austin, and literary celebrity at the Folger Shakespeare Library, Library excuse me, with Janine Barchus, and has co-edited two new anthologies of 18th century drama with Misty Anderson and Daniel O'Quinn for Routledge Press. She just finished co-editing with Nora Nachumi, Making Stars, Biography and Celebrity in 18th Century Britain, a collection of essays on the relationship between celebrity and biography in the 18th century. Her current scholarly project, a book entitled Public Knowledge and the Problem of Inclusion in 18th Century British Commercial Entertainment, examines archival evidence of how theater and other forms of popular entertainment contributed to modern ideas of public knowledge. And finally, from across the pond, David Taylor is an associate professor at Oxford University and a fellow at St. Hugh's College. He is author of Theaters of Opposition, Empire Revolution, and Richard, and Richard Brinsley Sheridan, sorry, I don't have enough spit in my mouth, and The Politics of Parody, A Literary History of Caricature, and co-editor of the Oxford Handbook of the Georgian Theater, 1737 to 1832. Please help me welcome Misty, Christina, and David. Hi, everybody. Hello. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I should have had a larger drink of water before I started all of those marvelous introductions and bios. Um, so let's get, uh, let's go right into, to how did you start? How did, how did the R18 Collective start? So Sharon, I'm going to take that one. And thanks again for having us. Um, this is a real delight. Uh, as you, uh, you know, as you just sort of illustrated, we've all written a lot of books about uh, restoration in 18th century theater. Um, but a few of us started talking at a conference that was in Edinburgh 
uh, I, we were all presenting on our current theater research. Uh, and then uh, at the end of that conference, you know, we were saying, well, wouldn't it be great to see more of these plays? A few of us went down to Stratford to see the double bill of Venice Preserved and Provoked Wife. And it was so rare to see two plays from the period. Uh, mm -hmm. And while we were there, Danny O'Quinn, Lisa Freeman, and I were sitting out on that wonderful, you know, sort of deck area outside of the RSC saying, wouldn't it be amazing if we could get more theater companies to do this kind of work? We feel like they only scratched the surface, um, same six plays. Um, and we also wanted to go at what, um, what Lisa lovingly calls the unbearable whiteness of restoration comedy. You know, what do these plays do for us? How, how do they help us understand um, the history of the present, um, which includes the history of race and nation? And how can we get away from certain stylized assumptions about what acting was like and um, how to approach these plays? So we believe there's a lot sitting in them um, for theater companies now, uh, okay. both joyful, sexy comedies and um, some some really brilliant tragedies that haven't made it to the stage in a while too. So that's kind of our origin story. So I have, a, I have, an, I have an addition to add on to that. Um, how how did you collect your other members then? Like how like how many how many are there of you? And do you do you want to add more? Does, has somebody gone? Oh, can't take it anymore, right? I have to. I have, right, like my like I'm too scattered, right? Like like you don't have time, right? Because this is your this is your labor of love. So so, how do how do you decide who gets to be in the group? Who gets to be yeah. in the well, you know, this really comes out of, of uh, long-standing connections between scholars. So the other three core members who aren't here today are Lisa Freeman, who's at the University of Chicago, uh, University of Illinois, Chicago, um, Danny O'Quinn, who is at University of Guelph in Canada, and uh, Tracy Davis, who is at Northwestern University. So we, we did all know each other, but once we realized we might have something here, we started reaching out saying, hey, and, you know, everybody's really stayed in, but we definitely do want to grow. Awesome. I think one, one of the things that brought us together is that at some point or another in our, in many cases, very long relationships, um, it's, you know, I've been hanging out with people like this since 1984. <laughs> um, it occurred to us that that as people who study theater, we really needed to see theater. Uh, we needed to see these plays performed, um, that it was not sufficient uh, to read them, even to teach them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can do just so much with readers theater in the classroom and it's great. And I did it all the time and my students loved it. But to see what um, theater artists on a professional level uh, do with these plays was not just a pleasure, it certainly is that, but it really helped us understand things about these plays that we could not possibly access in the library or the classroom. Mm -hmm. So that's a sort of commonality that um, that that made the group of us come together. Sorry, I have I lied. I have another follow up question <laughs> um, because right this is this is very specific. So we we touched a, a little bit about on this um, last week, uh, Misty and Christina uh, talking about uh, bold stroke for a wife. But is there? And I'm going to start with you, David. Is there a particular moment somewhere in your history that you were like, oh, I got to study the 18th century? Like, what was it that grabbed you particularly about this century that you were like, no, nope, this is it. I got it. This is this is my this is my jam. So yeah. was it, did you see a play? Did you was there was it a teacher? Was it what mm. was it? That's a really good question. I think. Speaking about the 18th century and not just about the theatre, though this point definitely also applies to the stage, it's a century that combines a kind of wonderful sense of the weird. There's lots of strange things about the 18th century with a real sense of the familiar, of things that, that we are, it, it, uh, it's a, a long running joke among 18th century scholars that we are still in the long 18th century. Okay, that the, the, 
that many of the things, many of the ways of thinking, many of the institutions that the 18th century gave us are, are still with us now. So there's a, I suppose one, one big draw for me to the 18th century and something I always, I always try to share with my students is that, that really interesting combination of a sense of inheritance on the one hand and a sense sometimes of just outright weirdness on the other hand. I mean, what led me to it? I think, I, I think to be honest, I got led back. Um, I, 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 it's perhaps a slight convergence in that I was really interested in uh, in uh, at university in Shakespeare. I was also in some early Restoration drama. I was also very much kind of fascinated by um, the Romantic poets, and I just found myself coming from both those directions, forward in time from Shakespeare and back in time from Romanticism, just discovering the century, discovering the centuries, theatre. I'd studied um, Sheridan's plays at school, and I was lucky enough to go to school quite near stratton upon avon so our, our drama teacher would take us regularly to the RSC, and we saw mm. two Sheridan plays there. Mm. And I suppose that was one, one way in which um, I, I kind of started to get really interested in the theatre. Uh, and then I was lucky to have some amazing teachers at university um, who um, really extended my, kind of deepened my interest both in the theatre and, and in the 18th century. It's the best answer I can give, I suppose. It's a great answer. Because it, right, because it's, it's, it's not, sometimes it's not just simple. It's not just one thing. <laughs> like, it's an overlapping layer of so many things that, that came together. Um, yes. Mr. Christina, go ahead. Who wants, who wants to answer well, that? I want to just add what David said is agreement about the weird. Yeah. Uh, and, and that was really what drew me. Um, that, um, you know, I'd be reading along and I'd go, yeah, enlightenment reason. Yeah. You know, um, um, heterosexual marriage. Yeah, yeah, here we go. And then something would pop out at me that was like completely unsettling those kind of, you know, bedrock institutional assumptions behind gender, sexuality, the state, uh, behind race, behind all of those issues. Um, that that we sort of lean on is as a, as if they were always there. Well, they certainly weren't. Mm -hmm. And the 18th century um, across genres uh, really exposes the the sort of um, fragility of a lot of those institutions that have come to rule our lives. I mean, heterosexuality is a great example. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it's not such um, a firm assumption <laughs> mm -hmm. right. well, in the 18th century. Yeah. And, I, and I'll give a third cheer for the weird. It was the weird that got me there. And a lot of that was gender and sexuality, but also kind of confronting my own assumptions as a student that the past was more prudish mm -hmm. and it's it's the modern era that has embraced sexuality. Well, if you read the country wife, you know that it's going to turn that assumption on, on its head. But along with that, you see, as Christina pointed out, um, that gender and sexuality are not these stable poles. Um, that a lot of the anxiety around, for instance, luxury goods and consumption comes out around these male characters, these fob characters. Uh, you know, there's almost a kind of um, sexual panic around what masculinity means. And so all of my little easy assumptions about past and present and about the stability of um, some, some notion of bourgeois norms um, really got busted up in a beautiful way. And also I love some of the formally weird things like Henry Fielding's plays. They're just, they're just gonzo. Um, you know, something like author's farce or uh, uh, Tom Thumb, you know, they're weird. They're puppets and people on stage together. Um, and I thought, what is this place? You know, I've got to know more. I've got to know more. Awesome. David, you said you wanted to jump in and yeah, ask. One, one thing I should have said, which was, was that the amazing thing that once you kind of start to become interested in this period of theatre is just how much it gives in that there's this general assumption shared by uh, people, not both scholars and, uh, and audiences, 
that we have Shakespeare, uh, that we have some restoration drama, some Congreve, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you know something like *The Man of Mode* or indeed *The Country Wife*. We could basically briefly jump into the 18th century through something like *Goldsmith*, *She Stoops to Conquer*, and Sheridan's *Arrivals* or *The Scandal*. And then we can jump again, more or less, if we're thinking about British theatre, to the to the end of the 19th century, to uh, Oscar Wilde, to George Bernard mm -hmm. Shaw. What you have then is this huge period of theatre history, a period in which the theatre was at such an important art form. Um, and that, that all of these plays that aren't being staged, that have been forgotten, aren't being researched. Um, and so it's a gift. It's a gift for it for, for you as a researcher because mm -hmm. there's, there's this repertoire there that's been largely forgotten. It's this unbelievable archive of the way people were thinking, of the way people were feeling, of, of what people were doing, of what people were debating, mm -hmm. uh, how people were performing. Uh, and I mean, that that for me was a real light bulb moment. I mean, that it's just so exciting. It's, it's still, even though now, I mean, We've been lucky in, our, in, our, in the field of 18th century theatre studies. We've been kind of in boom times in the past 20 years or more, but there's still so much to discover. Mm. That, that actually leading that kind of leads me right into the next thing. So, what are what are you working on? What kind of collaborations are you working on? And you, Missy, specifically bringing up um, gender and sexuality. Can you talk about the project you just got done doing with Red Bull? Because that's what it made me think of? Yes, yes, but I'm going to rotate back just a little bit, mm -hmm. to say a, a little more about how we got where we are, because yes. we were just picking up a head of steam in 2000. I'd been over, um, I was at, at Oxford with David for a conference, and we started meeting with directors. We thought, this is great, you know, here we go. And then, as we all know, poof, um, went everything. Right. And so one of our ideas had been to eventually create a website and we bumped that up on the docket because so many of our colleagues were scrambling to teach. And we thought, well, let's let's figure this out here in public. And then um, we staged a couple of pandemic productions on Zoom. We did Emperor of the Moon and The Critic. And those are lots of fun. And they were ways to um, basically to pay actors during the pandemic through voluntary contributions. That was important to us and, and just have some community. Um, but that did lead to uh, this really great opportunity for us with the Red Bull. And I'll, I'll pitch it over to Christina to talk about our Convent of Pleasure production there. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, this is a pattern which I'm hoping will continue. Um, I um, was, Misty and I were knocked out by um, some Zoom productions that Red Bull did. Mm -hmm. uh, one was of... Um, I think a hitherto unperformed play called uh, Francis Burney's The Woman Hater. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, one of the most popular plays uh, in the 18th century, Hannah Cowley's um, Bell's uh, Stratagem. Uh, these were really well done. And uh, in the, the sort of bowl session that they do afterwards on the, uh, that Red Bull does, where you get to sort of talk with the artist. Uh, and the dramaturg, it really became clear to us that Red Bull was on to something, that they knew something was going on with these 18th century texts that was extremely interesting. And so I cold emailed them. <laughs> uh, and uh, Jeffrey Gerber uh, very graciously got right back to me, the artistic director of, of Red Bull. And um, I had a little bit of funding from this Carnegie Mellon's uh, Center for Arts and Society. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, could pay actors because that was, again, one of our real motives throughout this whole period of the pandemic and the theaters being shot was to give work to um, uh, theater artists. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we did this production of the 17th century play by Margaret Cavendish, uh, which is weird, talk about weird, weird keeps coming up, but it does, um, which was weird as all heck. Um, and uh, great fun. Uh, Kim Wheel, who is the head of the John Wells directing program at CMU, signed on and did beautiful work. Misty dramaturged her tail off. Uh, she was fantastic. And uh, the actors managed to get their heads around this really not easy uh, 17th century woman's 
really utopian, almost science fiction-like vision mm -hmm. um, of a play called The Convent of Pleasure. Um, and uh, it, was, it was just a real joy to see what um, the director and uh, actors could do with the gender ambiguity uh, that is just built into that play, mm -hmm. um, which was a never performed uh, before closet drama at when it was written in, first published in 1668. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Cavendish is a fascinating figure, and and Kim Kim Wheel, our director, was a goddess, an absolute goddess. Um, and so this is one of those like quickie readings, right? We basically had two rehearsals and go. Um, but Cavendish wrote about how she her plays were different from Shakespeare's plays and from Ben Jonson's plays because she could be experimental, and she didn't care if um, if a theater didn't do them. She was. She was a you know a, a noble woman. She was a duchess. She didn't have to make money on this. She was very interested in the art. So she gives us this almost. I mean, there's a there's a truly postmodern feel to it. Um, it. You know, it gets surreal, and the gender ambiguity that Christina alludes to includes a reference to this is supposed to be an all female space, but right? a convent of pleasure where mm -hmm. rich women can take their dowries and instead of enriching a man and having to endure a very, very unequal and often violent marriage, they would take the money, go to the convent and have basically a permanent spa day and theater every day. And things would be wonderful and lush. And the lush descriptions um, of this space are given to us by Lady Happy, who's the one who organizes the convent. Mm -hmm. And so there are other women who come and some, uh, a, a princess from a neighboring country joins the convent. And in the, in the um, cast list, that's all we see is princess. And um, it, by the end, we find out this princess is not a regular princess and reveals as a prince. But we wanted to play with and play um, the experience of ambiguity. And so we didn't want to have just cisgender actors in this. And Kim found a brilliant cast. And it really let us lean into very experimental love scenes between these characters. Um, and Lady Happy believes the princess to be a princess and right. falls in love with her. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. yeah, you're right. Weird, but great. It's great. But, um, uh, David, could you, could you talk about... Uh, Messiah, the Messiah Complex panel? Sure, yeah. So that uh, alongside, so one of the things obviously we've been trying to do, as we've said, is, is work with theatre makers, professional theatre makers, to get this work performed in all kinds of ways, whether it's on Zoom or it's you know, on, on, a, on an actual stage. Mm -hmm. uh, alongside that, we are really keen to work with and support theatre makers who, who have done really interesting work and um, Messiah Complex was um, a production of Against, Against the Grain Theatre in Toronto. And they worked with uh, Toronto Symphony Orchestra, orchestra um, to kind of recreate Handel's Messiah. They did this right mm -hmm. towards the very end of, of 2020. So, you know, this is, I mean, at the time it felt like we'd been in the pandemic for a long time, but, you know, um, you know, now it's, it's still right in the, the early, early, early months of the pandemic, I suppose, in some ways. And so that they they were doing something, they were trying to create a messiah that could be COVID safe. Mm. Um, but what they produced was this kind of unbelievable and remarkably moving adaptation of Handel's Messiah, which involved um, filming um, a variety of singers against these iconic Canadian landscapes industrial and 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 rural um you know across i think more or less every province uh, and territory across canada and they um uh they had 12 soloists four choirs um and the uh the singers were singing in a variety of languages six different languages uh, including um indigenous languages okay um so it was a fascinating way of rethinking what Messiah could be and do mm -hmm. politically, socially, 
uh, a fascinating way of thinking about nation. Uh, and uh, what we did was to organize a round table, it's like an online round table, essentially. I say we, I mean, it was the, the person leading this with our, our wonderful colleague, Danny O'Quinn. And uh, the round table brought together um, some, uh, some scholars on, on, it, on the 18th, of the 18th century. Uh, along with the co-directors, Winalta Aluk and uh, Joel Ibani, um, and one of the singers, Lila Gilde, who's of the Dene Nation, uh, who's a singer-songwriter. Uh, and it, it allowed us um, to, to support Against the Grain, but also really to begin to, to try and process just what a remarkable work of art Against the Grain and, uh, and their collaborators have, have created. I don't know whether Misty or Christina want to add something to this. No, but I'd love to hear you also talk about what just happened. Oh yes, yes. In your neighborhood. Yeah. So, um, in my neck of the woods, I um, I have managed to secure some some funding from the Arts and Humanities Research Council in Britain for um, a couple of events. The first of which was just last week, and what we did was uh, we staged a, a script in hand performance of play by Hannah Cowley from 1779 called Who the Duke. Um, we did, what happened was we, we had six actors, six professional actors, um, a professional director, I'll say more about him in a moment, and we started rehearsing at 9.30 in the morning and we just plowed through and, and performed for um, a public audience at uh, 5.30 in the, in the evening. Um, it, and, it, and it was an intense and wonderful day. Uh, Who's the Duke? This play is what we would call an art piece. Okay, so that if you go, if you go to the theatre in the 18th century, you're not necessarily going to go and watch just one play. You'll get uh, what uh, uh, maybe a five act comedy or tragedy, what we, what we would call a main piece, and then you get other other entertainments as well, including usually an after what's called an after, after piece. So that these are usually short plays, um, always um, comic. Uh, farcical. So, who's a dupe is a farce, and it's an afterpiece. And and uh, the benefit of, of something like who's a dupe is that it it's it's I mean, it's a brilliantly tightly constructed play. But it's also not particularly long play. It's only it's only two acts, so it doesn't take too long to perform. It only needs about six actors to perform it. So, it has some some, some practical virtues as well as being an absolutely uh, brilliant play about how a young woman um, uh, evades. Uh, marrying the man her father insists that she should marry mm. uh, in what becomes a, 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 an increasingly absurd situation. Her father wants her to marry an, a, an Oxford academic. He wants her to mar marry a man of education, a, a man of, of learning. Uh, her father is a, is a cockney merchant who's come good. Um, she uh, is uh, is keen on someone else, uh, a soldier. Indeed, in fact, a a soldier of the uh, uh, American Revolutionary War, no less, um, but he's poor. Uh, and uh, along the way, uh, as part of the ruse, this Oxford academic is convinced to kind of abandon his scholarly ways, like his tweed jacket, and instead try and um, and act the kind of the man about town, uh, which is cause for, for great laughter. So um, it, it was, we, we filmed it, um, we, uh, and, uh, I hope to be able to release the footage. We're going to show the footage to everyone who wants to see it for, for a week uh, once it's released, uh, and then to any um, researchers or teachers who want to look at it thereafter um, uh, on request. And uh, it was great in particular to work with a director, Colin Blumenau, who I've worked with before. Um, Colin, Colin, nobody in the world has sort of staged, would have directed more 18th century plays than Colin. Colin, uh, for many years, was the artistic director of a theatre in a town over here in the east of, of England called Bury St Edmunds. And they have a theatre there that was, was opened in 1819. Mm. And they secured money about 15 years ago to restore the theatre to its original Regency state. And along with that money for the building, for fabric, if you like, came money to restore the repertoire. So they spent five years wow. staging forgotten plays of the 18th century, and I was lucky enough to be part of that. And 
and it's wonderful to work with Colin again because you know he has just this amazing expertise. That's fantastic. I want to come. <laughs> <laughs> Please join us. Yes. I swear I'll save up for that plane ticket, but whoo, baby. Um, Christina, can you talk about the um, the Newberry online event? Sure. This was um, something that we did um, on Zoom uh, because we had to. Uh, but the Newberry Library um, has been uh, very kind in uh, hosting um, some of our events. Uh, this first one uh, really was spearheaded by Lisa Freeman at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Um, and basically, we put out a call to the 18th century scholarly community, uh, the, the theater folks out there, and said, hey, pitch a play. Mm -hmm. What play would you like to see performed on the modern stage? And uh, we got a bunch of, really, a huge number of um, people throwing uh, pitches our way. And uh, we kind of did it like a contest and ended up uh, choosing the top three pitches to do some staged reading, not staged reading, some, some readings at the Newberry mm -hmm. uh, online. We're all on Zoom. There were, what, 25 scholars? Is that correct? I think so, yeah. So, and we had about 18 actors. Yes. The day too. A lovely, lovely crew of actors um, that did an amazing job and we uh, we ran scenes from two comedies and a tragedy um, and again this is all on film um, but it was kind of uh, well it was not kind of it was revelatory um, they the comedies were hilarious uh, they, the actors picked up the possibilities for instance there's a preacher in um, one of the um, the plays, one of the comedies, um, that um, the actor just very naturally transitioned into a kind of mega church, you know, um, big, big, larger than life kind of <clears throat> performer at the pulpit. Mm -hmm. uh, was fabulous, but the real sort of uh, eye opener was the tragedy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you want to talk about? Uh, yeah, I was going to. Somebody, somebody, tell me why. Why was it? Why? Yeah. why was that yeah. an idea? Absolutely. So the tragedy was um, Zara by Aaron Hill, and we're sat here in a kind of you know in a seraglio Middle Eastern um, uh, scenario in which the, uh, the the mogul has taken as his prisoner these this young Christian. Right, that's mm -hmm. what we know about her, but she's a slave there. Um, and this is this is one of many plays in the 18th century that feature an Islamic or a Muslim or a Middle Eastern world as a kind of counterpoint to, but often sometimes a better manifestation of Republican or Enlightenment ideals. Um, so he is uh, he is an enlightened figure, and he's fallen in love with this young woman. And so when it when the as the play opens, Zara. And her friend, who is also technically a captive, are talking about what it means to have fallen in love under these circumstances, what it, what his devotion means, and what this is going to mean in terms of taking apart his authority because he's going to marry her. The play, uh, you know, proves to be complicated after that. Part of why we picked it is because there is a kind of just a raw power in this opening, and it was a scene that would work on its own. Right, so we don't get to unpack the whole play. It kind of had to work as its own beat. And the young woman who played Zara um, was mind-blowingly good. We also found out she got into um, uh, into Juilliard the day after we did this. Right? Okay, so we were really, really lucky. Um, and uh, you know, having having a lot of young talent, and during the pandemic, of course, we had a lot of people who would have been working and who were really happy to just have an honorarium to help us out. And so I think that the tragedies, the, the part of the revelation for me mm -hmm. in the tragedy was that the, um, the, the linguistic power of this scene held even on Zoom. And there, was a, there is a, a, 
it's not quite an introspection, but an investigation of how power works. That's one of the consistent features of 18th century theater. It's one of the things that I love. There's a self-reflexive quality um, and that worked beautifully, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Even around, dancing around some really complicated ideas about race and power and the way the term slave is used. Let us kind of go there and think about it. And, and to be able to talk to actors about it, you know, we split off into three little groups. Each group had a dramaturgical team, the scholars, and then a group of actors. And basically only had time to read through the scene twice and then and then go. But then, you know, we showed all the scenes and talked about them and it was delicious. It was just a great kind of tightrope experience where we're trying to model, and I think this is what we were trying to do, and I think we succeeded, model what it's like for a bunch of academics to come together who are not theater makers, um, but who have resources, who know things about the period, and who can identify plays that you just haven't heard of. Zara by Aaron Hill, right? No, no nobody does this play. Right. Um, and to, to work respectfully um, with incredibly talented actors, um, just to try to start seeing what we might be able to teach each other. Yeah, um, and I'm I'm grateful to both you, Misty and Christina, because it is you who found me. Um, and, uh, and then we had a Zoom meeting how many months ago and um, I, in a not so perfect twist of fate, uh, we had chosen a bold stroke for a wife uh, to uh, to be part of our inaugural season of Expand the Canon. So we got to I got to talk to two the two of you last week with Elena, our director, and then um, on Mother's Day, as I was moving my eldest from one dorm room to another during the first show, I missed missing Christina. But can Christina, can you talk about what? I, I adore that play. Um, so I got to I got to I got to listen to it again. Um, right. And we had 26 hours to rehearse. I think we actually used 21 of them. Um, but there were lots of lovely discussions during the week um, about this particular play. But how was it, Christina, to come see it? I mean, I because, you know, I missed you. So sorry. Um, so talk about because this is a collaboration I want to hang on to and keep like I am furiously writing more notes than I can hear I'm not gonna be able to read them later but like all sorts of right all sorts of of ideas um to start looking both for our main stage and to pitch and for um for our next as long as we can keep doing expand the canon um so yes please talk about coming to see it please it, it was fantastic. Just let me just say that for for starters, um, and I, I really what I took away reinforced my sense that we really don't understand these plays until we see them on the feet right. in some way, shape, or form. Right. Um, because the interaction, the, it's okay. The plot involves a woman who's in an impossible situation. Mm -hmm. She's wealthy. She's, uh, but she has been uh, put under the authority of four guardians who can never agree on who she should marry. Before the play begins, she actually meets and kind of digs this guy who is a soldier. It's interesting how many soldiers um, right. up in these romantic plots. Um, and uh, she, you know, as, as the director, Elena, put it so succinctly, she turns to him and says, let's do this, but we have a little problem <laughs> with these four lines. And what came across in the play, and I've taught this play in the classroom, you know, mm -hmm. uh, what came across from the performance that really doesn't come across strongly on the page is how completely in the middle of things this woman is. She, yes, she's been put in a position without any power, mm -hmm. but she is using every tool available to her to control the situation and to get herself out of this hole that her uh, father has put her in mm -hmm. with this ridiculous will and its conditions. Um, and that was amazing. Um, uh, the, the thing that I expected, I also got, 
It was tremendously fun. Good. Um, the, Good. Um, the Quaker scenes worked beautifully. Um, <laughs> the, the kind of um, uh, assumption of purity being the kind of real sexual come on, in fact, uh, the kind of hypocrisy that gets uh, played up for laughs in that scene. I worried a little bit about it because mm -hmm. we have a very different view of Quakers now right. than what was in place for um, small Eagle in the um, early 18th century. Um, but uh, they, you know, the the actors and, and Ellen, I suspect, had something to do with this, um, really picked it up in terms of any kind of religious hypocrisy you might think right. of. Right. So mm -hmm. kind of, you know, mega church guy who gets caught in bifling the funds. Uh, that's really what came across. Uh, and it was very funny and it wasn't, uh, did not seem to be a problem judging from the laughter for the audience who was there. Right. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you the, uh, the, Eleanor used a very specific person when she was talking about pulpiting and that was, jo that was Joel Osteen. Um, so, right. And, uh, and, and she actually said that to um, Joe who played Colonel Fainwell. So like for him to get caught up in his, and I'm like, Oh, yep. I can so see the crystal yeah. house right now. It was like, <laughs> it was, so it didn't matter that it was right Quaker. It could be any, yeah. anything from the yeah. pulpit. Um, we did have, we, we ran into one tiny problem, which was, um, the very long scene because it was 13 pages, um, with, um, Periwinkle, yeah. right? So we were, and we were, what we ended up cutting, maybe, maybe a total of, because I was like, yeah, don't cut it. And then we were like, no, we have to, because it was, it was, um, what we realized was that that as beautiful as all all of these descriptions were that Saint Libra was giving about all of these travels, right, and all of these things that that Fainwell was was coming up with, didn't make much sense if we couldn't see them. So, like that specifically, like if we were doing it on stage, it would have made perfect sense. Yeah. But for for the sake mm -hmm. of modern audiences ears we were like no nope, we got to keep the it has to because it has to move and move and move and move until you get to the magic um the the belt of invisibility right with the trap yeah. so that's so that's what we were leading up to and we were like yep yeah, no no mm -hmm. no no this is this was me leaning over l on his shoulder going no that goes by no no from here no we're gonna skip three no and i'm like oh my god we just cut out like a page and a half of the play in five minutes and then i was like you know but it was oh, but it, yes, that's so that's okay because that's what would have been done on the stage exactly you know, 200 years ago. Yeah. Uh, these plays were not considered sacred. Mm -hmm. um, no, they are to me though. That's why I get right. No, were, I I know. And I appreciate your respect, but it's not necessary. The point here is good theater. Um, and that mm -hmm. I agreed with what you did with the periwinkle scene. Okay. Um, it, but I would also add that you know the the actor who um, was cast in the periwinkle role uh, teaches clowning at uh, University of West Virginia. There there would have been so many great opportunities uh, mm -hmm. for a full stage uh, production for that scene to do something very different than what it yeah. did. What it, for for a reading it was perfect. Yeah, mm -hmm. good. Oh no, I feel yeah. better. Whoo, it's right. Right. It's also the, do you want to stay true, right? Especially since it's new to people, right? You're like, I would like you to see it in its entirety because it's brand new for everybody. Um, there were, there were even, there were even comments in the second, in the second talk back that were like, I didn't get it. Right. So I'm running my lines with my wife and I, I'm like, I don't get it. And then, and then seeing it in its entirety, he was like, now I get it. This was I, I totally understand why this why this particular play was chosen to represent in this particular season of readings of expand the can he was like now I get it I'm like thank you <laughs> so that made me that made, I was like oh yay us we did it right right one of those things um sorry Misty did you want to add something well and I bet David does too but really this is not just a case of of me as an individual scholar and somebody she's worked as a dramaturg and a script editor 
um, saying, you know, uh, sacred cows make great burgers, but this is a fundamentally restoration 18th century approach to the script. Mm -hmm. And so in the second volume of the anthology that Christina and Damian O'Quinn and I edited, we actually reproduced what was a published prompter copy Okay, so even printers would do this because people were interested in the difference between what was spoken on stage and they understood there was a longer text. So in our edition of Saint Lever's The Wonder, A Woman Who Keeps a Secret, which is another gem of a play that, like Bold Stroke, has this great female character who's almost functionally a stage manager, who's kind of managing this chaos within the play. And we printed it so that you could see how in at the you know, later in the 18th century, because the great actor David Garrick chose it as his exit play, um, what what we believe was actually on stage, and you could kind of see grayed out what was cut. So we're all about the um, understanding that text as a very good starting place. Mm -hmm. Okay, Absolutely. David, did you want to add anything? So just that I think sometimes, understandably, that. Uh, when uh, theatre makers and academics enter the same space, theatre makers might understandably think, well, academics are going to say, well, this is how you must do it. Okay, you must do it this way. Or you can't cut those lines, you can't cut that scene, you can't change that, that element of the play. And that we're, we're really, the R18 Collective is not about a kind of museum approach to this theatre. We are about we want to see these plays staged and we want to see them staged in interesting and even experimental ways okay so you you'll yeah you won't you won't hear us complaining because you decide to cut something or do something a bit different right no just the actors because they won't have enough to say um, <laughs> right? like, you cut my lines like we did the same thing with the prologue we were like well we're going to add the prologue back in right, right? right and we did it as if as if mrs lovely is like this is my story. Here it is. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? Sorry, we got to get rid of three quarters of the prologue. I'm like, we're topping and tailing it. That's it. It's it's clean. It's cut. We make a stab at Moliere. Here we go. Bye. Right. Um, so, and we're like, oh, that's better. <laughs> um, so thank you. You see, now I feel better as an actor and a producer to have your academic blessing. This makes me, this makes me feel much happier. And I know that people who are watching this will later go, oh, thank God we're allowed to cut stuff and we won't feel bad. We won't feel bad. Look, really. I think you have just made lots of producers and artistic directors just go. <laughs> well, we, we okay. hope so. And actually, uh, we're hoping. Oops. I'm sorry. It's all good. Um, we're, yes, we're all about we're all about the cuts, and we want people to yeah. feel that they're. Well, I think it would just be a good point, maybe, to talk about the uh, the venture we're embarking on with the Newberry. Yes, please. Uh, again, next fall. Yeah. Yes. So we have, um, we have and, and Shirley been trying to find ways to make this vision of theater makers and academics in the room together, generating more work real. And so um, David uh, won some grant money from the British government through the AHRC program. I won a little grant money through my university center for global engagement. Um, Lisa Freeman uh, and Christina's uh, funds, and we kind of pulled this together, and we are holding a symposium at the end of October, where we're finally going to get to be in the room together, and now live with um, our embodied selves, um, be able to run some more experiments on um, and what will probably be three more plays, mm -hmm. and we're negotiating our pool down because again we want to bring forward the plays that you probably haven't heard of that we also think are stage worthy that have fallen out of the repertoire not because they're not performable um but just because they've been passed over right. um, so we're we're winnowing that pool and we're actually having play school uh every other week uh where we all sit down and read some plays together and um and go through this to try to come up with a, a very good list so um i mentioned earlier that pre-pandemic, um, David uh, held a wonderful conference at Oxford and I was there and we were meeting with Colin Blumenau, we already mentioned, and Philip Green, who was the director of that 
lovely RSC production of Provoked Wife. And so we're hoping to bring Philip out. He's currently one of the associate directors for the Royal Shakespeare Company. Mm -hmm. And we are putting out calls to different people um, to kind of gather together some actors, some directors, some academics, um, and engage in these experiments, which is gonna include some you know, really edgy experiments. How do we talk about the long history of race and empire? What does it mean when you put something up on a stage to ask questions, to critique, to understand how we got here? Um, so we, are, we take this work very seriously and we're trying to be really mindful. And we also understand we need theater makers to have this conversation with us. Right. Um, right. And so we're really excited about that. Um, and we're, we're hoping to present uh, a, a broader menu um, than what most folks have ready to hand when they think about restoration or 18th century theater. Great. David, could you address the Inchbald Conference, please? Sure. So the Inchbald Conference, on the one hand, will be a, um, a conference which brings together academics to talk about. So Elizabeth Inchbald, um, is this amazing figure from from the from the, the end of the 18th century? Uh, she was an actress, uh, uh, but she was also pretty much the most prolific and successful playwright in the final 20 years of the 18th century on the London stage. Mm -hmm. um, she was more or less playwright in residence at Covent Garden Theatre um, at that time. Uh, wrote some unbelievable plays. Uh, mm -hmm. Went on indeed to to be a really important critic of plays in the early 19th century, as well as a successful novelist. So she's this remarkable woman who, again, has been undeservedly neglected. Um, 2021 was the bicentenary of her death. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had planned to hold a conference then. Um, COVID uh, uh, disrupted that along with so many things. So we're, we're uh, a year late in celebrating uh, 200 years uh, since her death. So. But there's that celebration, but the core of that will be um, a, another performance directed by Colin Blumenau. Um, this time, hopefully, with a little bit longer to rehearse, at least two days, hopefully, rather than just yeah. the, the one day. And we'll be we'll be doing another after piece, another one of these short plays. This time, Elizabeth Inchbold's uh, past Animal Mag Animal Magnetism, which is a uh, a brilliant play about uh, sending up. Um, pseudoscience and, and, and mesmerism, uh, uh, and again, at the centre of it, uh, I feel like this is the kind of recurrent theme of, of, of our discussion uh, this afternoon, but uh, again, at the centre of it, you've got some incredibly clever women who are really in complete control of what's going on. A play that's all about how bodies are being controlled and who can control bodies, and particularly men who are desperate to control bodies. Right. Yeah, but, it's the women who are, who are in charge. And um, uh, Inchbold's stagecraft is just second to none. I mean, she, she's an, uh, uh, an actress who, who becomes a playwright. She just, she knows exactly how, how things can work. Comic timing, how to, how, how, exactly how to construct scenes. Um, her, her theatrical intelligence is just so brilliant. And um, uh, we'll, we'll be recording that one as well again. So those of you who can't come to Oxford, in September, uh, can watch um, uh, that performance, and, and we look forward to sharing it with you. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, okay, so future, where do you want where do you want the R eighteen collective to go? What do you want to do? You want to get to every continent, including Antarctica? <laughs> <laughs> Where uh, we do have some big plans, and one of the first things we know we need to do um, is to grow uh, and welcome some younger scholars, some people who are working on things like the history of, uh, of, of race and of representation of blackness on the 18th century stage. You know, we're all interested in this. Um, we, uh, we, we could use more people who work specifically on um, things like spectacle and special effects. So we, you know, we, uh, we're a pandemic production ourselves and we've been getting by and getting, quite honestly, getting one another through the pandemic. It's been a really important set of relationships, you know, a, a real touch point where something beautiful came out of, uh, of a terrible time for all of us. Um, so we are continuing to develop our, our website 
and there will be more to it this summer we'll be launching a database on our website that will help theater makers find the personnel and the productions from the last 15 years professional productions so if you want to find out who's directed this stuff who's been in it um you want some headshots you want the website um we've got about 150 professional productions indexed right now and you'll be able to go through and find, you want to find a costume designer you know uh, and so we are limiting that to professional productions in the Anglophone world, and it will grow, and we'll be really happy to take more uh, items in on that. We want it to be a working um, database and archive. We're also collecting scripts, um, some edited scripts, some things that we feel like are ready to go and cut for performance. Mm -hmm. uh, David and I have both had uh, experience doing that with different directors and, and theaters. Um, we are uh, continuing to grow our list of um, what we call, you know, our pitchable plays. Mm -hmm. um, you can run through by cast size and uh, thematic um, and just be able to see some of this repertoire without um, assuming that everybody's a scholar and everybody's going to sit down with the books. So, you know, we're trying to, trying to think practically. And so, Sharon, you know, as a theater maker yourself, when you see this stuff, we welcome that input. We want this to be usable. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've talked to a few folks. We think we think we've got it, but we are always ready to learn. We have learned so much um, in this collaboration already mm -hmm. um, about what works, what doesn't. We understand it's going to take some experiments on all parts. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I got we'll, yeah, we'll continue to catalog video for um, for teaching purposes and uh, for just a chance to get a little window on what some of these productions have looked like, whether they are. Uh, whether they attempt to set in some kind of period construct or, or whether they uh, uh, are updated, like the Venice Preserved um, at the RSC a few years ago. So those are some of our some of our growing edge projects. What have I missed, Christine and David? <laughs> That's quite enough for yes. <laughs> <laughs> day jobs too. It's all I can think about at least right now. Um, it, it has been, you know, a kind of remarkable experience. Um, with, the amount of energy uh, that all us folks with day jobs, um, I'm recently retired, um, you know, um, I have managed to, to create in a short period of time. Right. Well, um, I'm just speaking for me. You're one of the greatest resources that I've bumped into, and I have no problem whatsoever crowing from the top of the building going, do you know about our 18 collective? Do you know about our 18? I'm like, here's, here's their link. And I just send it out to people. They're like, that's a really good resource. I'm like, I know that's why I'm sending it to you. Um, so on that, on that thought of, of um, like culling down your list of, of playables, right? Do you have a top three right now that like, you're like, Oh, you know what? I'd really like to see. I really want to see what would it be? I have a top pick right now. Actually. Yeah, what is it? There are three of us. We can each pick one. Yep. Okay. Uh, the um, uh, it's uh, a play uh, from the 1730s, I want to say, uh, by Edward Young called *The Revenge*, okay. and it's a tragedy, and nobody's heard of it, but it is um, every European's worst nightmare about what happens if you mess around too bad with an African man. Mm. Um, it is powerful. Um, it is tight. Um, it has a very workable cast number. Um, and like every scene is crafted. It, this, would, this is one that I think you could just plunk down on the stage. Okay. David or Misty, who wants to go next? I would, I want to say, I'm going to fly the Inchbold flag again. And I want to say that I think not just one of the greatest plays of the 18th century, but one of the masterpieces of British theatre period is Elizabeth Inchbold's Wives As They Were and Maids As They Are, which I think is an astonishingly clever play um, about womanhood, about again, how men control women, uh, but also a play that's just full of really clever surprises so right in the heart of this play you've got a woman who has been dominated by her by her husband essentially being tortured by her husband mm -hmm. uh, and imprisoned by her husband who um this rakish man 
uh, thinks he can liberate, right? And that's what she needs and deserves. And he liberates her. And at this brilliant moment in this play where she says, no, you, you don't get to decide for me. David, is that the scene where she, where she sits down and knits? She sits, yeah. He yeah, uh, you're, you're expecting a rape scene. Yeah, exactly. Well, a friend, and, and this woman quietly takes out her knitting. Exactly. <laughs> she sits down. He, he threatens her with rape. And, and her response is to sit down and take out her knitting bag. And he's so... He, she so brilliantly short circuits this kind of macho personality that that suddenly he's uh, uh, he's got uh, he's completely under her control. Okay, so a woman who seemed to the uh, up to this point to be passive takes takes charge, and it and it, it's just it's such a, a brilliant play. I mean, it, it, it it's it's written in the decade that Mary Wollstonecraft is really uh, is writing the the feminist. Inbrook, okay, mm -hmm. uh, and, and and this is absolutely a feminist play. It's a brilliant, brilliant play that deserves it, it should never have been forgotten. Mm. Misty, how about you? Excellent. Well, you know, usually I'm the comedy girl. I love those um, saucy, rakish, sexy restoration comedies, but I'm going to break with my own tradition and say that um, I've just become more and more obsessed with this play by um, uh, George Lillo called The London Merchant. And speaking of an exquisitely crafted play, it's just, it, it's just brilliant. Um, and we have, uh, you know, I think we've all taught it. It's not a complete unknown. Um, and I, I have seen one production of it that I, that stunned me because I wasn't quite sure, um, given its didactic edge, um, how it would work. It was riveting. Um, about a young man who is seduced by a slightly older woman who has been made desperate by uh, basically her situation in a patriarchal economy where she's been used and abused um, and his uh, his struggle and the psychological dynamic of the play is is really fascinating so I um, that one's that one's uh, an unlikely pitch for me today kind of where I am today um, and uh, and David already flew the Inchfeld flag so I do love her such things are but lots of good material with that one so i have a so i have a question are all of the plays that you've been talking about on your site um no <laughs> no we don't have the pitch for the revenge up but um because we're all academics coming to the end of the summer you can mm -hmm. expect more changes to our website this summer so check back maybe in august great okay yeah. beautiful because i see our uh your website is listed up there um so as, as, as academics, I have one more question for you because, but academics also as working with uh, theater makers and to be a resource to us, but this is also at the university level. How do we get more of these plays into schools? Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, obviously I'm gonna be, please go to www.r18collective.org, right? So it's other than that, how do I get, how do I get my, a high school AP English teacher, right, to, and it's just started, right? They're, they're just starting to switch out Shakespeare for other, for, right, for other playwrights. So how do we switch out, no offense to Richard Brinsley Sheridan, how do we switch out Richard Brinsley Sheridan, right, for Susanna Sotley or for Cavendish or for Inchbald? Like, how do we, besides handing teachers a pile of books going here, read these? Why should they, right? So how do we... How do how do we how do we start that conversation? Do you think anybody? I know it's a big one, but like how do how do we get these right? So I I'd never heard of Susanna Saltleaf until right. So and I went to theater school, a decent one in Chicago, DePaul University. Never heard of it, so it's not taught. So how do we get that into? What's the best? That's a really challenging question, Sherry, yeah. that, that gets into issues we don't really have time to talk about today, like the place of humanities in uh, K through 12 education right now in the United States. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, but, um, you know, I think one of the, the things that I am seeing is that there is a particular interest in these uh, in women playwrights. Uh, mm -hmm. That, you know, we, we're learning through recent uh, political events in this country that 
uh, you know, feminism still definitely has its uses, and we really do need to listen to women uh, with a thought. And, um, you know, a, a lot of these plays, a lot of people are surprised that there are all these plays written by women. Saltley, mm -hmm. uh, Inchwall, Bain, Ken Cowley, and Sheridan, there's, there's a ton of them. Um, and uh, that comes as a, almost a bit of fresh air relief um, in the very white male uh, canon mm -hmm. uh, uh, of early modern theater. So, I mean, that's, I think, one way to get a shoe in the door mm -hmm. is to tap into that interest mm -hmm. in women's voices. Mm -hmm. I, I think Christine is absolutely right. I, 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 I mean, when you say, uh, Sharon, when you say schools, are we talking drama schools or do you mean period? Period. Yeah. Like, right, because, because, right, yeah. so, so because I'm in, right, because we're in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Right. And to me, this is still far behind. We're just starting to add August Wilson plays, what, right? What? Yeah. To, right. And I'm like, to, to required reading in AP classes. I'm like, okay, that seems illogical that you should have been doing that like 30 years ago, not now. Right. I'm like, you have, Right. While he was alive, you have a living playwright in your own city and you're not studying him. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. Right. So it so that that more schools, high schools in Pittsburgh are starting to switch out, let's say, Shakespeare for August Wilson. So it should be an easy, an easy thing to make. Not that I don't love Eugene O'Neill. Right. For example. Right. Or Arthur Miller. We can easily switch somebody from a different period that nobody's ever heard of for somebody that mm -hmm. so i'm saying i'm saying it doesn't it can be at the university level it can be at the high school level just period mm -hmm. and i know that makes it even broader and vague bigger sorry yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I i think it's I, I mean it's difficult to know what comes first is it the schools and then the theaters but i mean for me i think the theaters can take a lead here um if if the more these plays are staged, the more people will learn about them, the more people, more people simply know that they exist. Right. Um, and then, you know, hopefully that will have an impact on uh, syllabuses at schools, at colleges, universities. You know, if people are seeing these plays, um, then, then I think that's the way it can change. I really do strongly feel that the, the, the stage can take a lead here. I mean, mm -hmm. um, uh, certainly, over here in, in Britain, schools will, will take their uh, classes. You know, as, as, as under you know, sixteen-year-old, fifteen-year-old, will, will go to whatever's on at their at their, their, their theatre nearby. I mean, I, I was lucky, as I said earlier, that what was nearby for me was the RSC. But even then, I you know, and that was Sheridan. Okay, right. Imagine, imagine if that had not been Sheridan. Imagine it had been sort of Lieber or Inchbold. Mm -hmm. There's no reason why it shouldn't be. Right. So. Right. I think it would be amazing if we could persuade some of the major rep theatres in um, Britain and America to do a season. You know, why not do a season of new plays by 18th century women? And they would be new plays. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Yeah. 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 People don't know about them. This is new work. It's just not, it's just also happens to be 18th century work. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and to that wonderful collective answer, I would just add, after pieces are short, yeah. and they allow you to drop something in, 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 a, in a rep situation or in a class, something like um, Intervals of Animal Magnetism, which also connects to another thing you see in a lot of the plays, including those plays by women, which is a sort of science and culture. How is science and technology changing the experience of everyday life? That's a theme in Emperor of the Moon. It's a theme in Animal Magnetism, the Gamester. And so I think those are some interesting ways in. Yeah, that's a perfect, that's a perfect ending. Thank you. Because hopefully people will now go, I need to go to the Carnegie Library and go <laughs> find some of these. Sorry, I need to, I need to Google r18collective.org first, go on that list, <laughs> see, see what they can't, what, what's not there or go to the library and now find the collected works of Susanna Sontlieb or Inchbald or Cavendish. So thank you very much, um, Christina and Misty and David for joining today. I love conversations like this. I really do. I really, really do. So thank you so, so much. Um, okay, everybody. 
Thank you very much for joining us. Please go to www.pickedtheater.org and reserve your tickets for Endgame, please, because it's a limited run. And thank you to our generous sponsor for today's webinar. Please get outside and enjoy what's left of the sunshine if you're in Pittsburgh, because it's supposed to rain all weekend, which is a perfect opportunity to come see Endgame. Thank you very much for joining us for today's conversation with members of the R18 Collective. Stay safe. I'll see you soon. Bye.